As I begin this sermon today, I invite you to consider the sum sermon topic, there is still more to come. There is still more to come. This summer, we had the opportunity to witness the Olympics in Paris, and it showcased not just athletes um, who had a profound resilience and determination, but it showed athletes who had overcome some things in order to win this year. As we cheered for the USA men's and women's basketball teams, the women's soccer team, we witnessed historic performances by young athletes from this very area. We were reminded that it, with each medal won in the Olympics, it was a testament not only to the skill of the athlete, but to the strength of the athlete. Many of these people that performed and went out to get gold medals, they did not just show up to run a race. They did not just show up to play a game, but they had gone through some things in their life that they had to overcome in order to be an Olympian. Um, I enjoy watching track and field and basketball and gymnastics. Um, and there was some standout moments this year at the Olympics. As I was watching the four by 100 meter relay weight race with the women, I was, ast was astounded to see these women. I was at the edge of my sofa watching them because it looked like Team USA was not going to win. It looked like they were falling behind. Um, however, Shakari Richardson, Gabby Thomas, TT, and some other, I can't even remember her name, they went out and they won. But they weren't just Olympians who were going to win. They were Olympians who had gone through some things. Many of us know Shakari Richardson's story where she was disqualified from the Tokyo Olympics because of an issue with some marijuana. Um, and in this issue that she had, she, while she was one of the fastest women in the world, she was not able to compete. It was a very big story because when they asked why she was in this situation, she found out while being interviewed that her mother, her biological mother had passed. She had to overcome some things to get to the Paris Olympics. One of the other Olympians by the name of Gabby Thomas, who won three gold medals. You look at her and they talked about how great she was. They talked about how outstanding her collegiate career was. She had gone to Harvard. She was in Texas. She's got a big degree. I don't even know how to say the degree, um, but she does health care and works in clinics. But Gabby Thomas tells the story that in what we see is that in order for her to be an Olympian, she had to overcome the feeling of being an imposter syndrome. Um, an imposter syndrome where she felt like she was in places that she did not belong. Not only were these women, um, some of the women who had to overcome some things in their life, um, Simone Biles, as we know, while she is one of the most decorated gymnasts, had to overcome criticism that she was, that was thrown at her because she was willing to take care of her mental health. Um, she was criticized because she decided in Tokyo to step back and they still criticized her despite what she needed to do for her own mental health. Not only was Simone Biles one of those who was criticized um, for some things, there were those Olympians who also had to overcome health challenges. Um, Suni Lee had battled with kidney failure. Um, there was a young lady from Brazil who didn't know if she was going to be able to do it because she had Achilles heel. These women found themselves where they felt that their lives had had been robbed of some things. They had to overcome some things. And while we may not be Olympians ourselves, is there anybody in here today who's ever lived a life where as much as you love Jesus, you feel like there are seasons where you have been robbed of some things. There are seasons in our lives where it feels like I can't overcome this. A season in our life where it feels like no matter how many times I move forward, I keep getting knocked back. And I believe but they're still places of unbelief. That, those are the places that many of these Olympians found themselves in, which is interesting because when they go to the Olympics and after the Olympics, I found out after about a day or two, they start training for the next Olympian, which would suggest that despite what they have gone through, despite what they need to overcome, despite what they feel robbed of, they still believe. Today, we come in account 
of someone who is struggling with unbelief. We are introduced to a family in this story. But before we get to the story, we're introduced to the one who shifts the story. Jesus in Mark chapter 9 and a couple, three of his disciples had um, experienced Mount Sinai. It was the place of transfiguration where the disciples who were with him on Mount Sinai had experienced that the Lord had revealed his glory and had demonstrated and shared with them that this is true the son of God. At this point, the disciples who were with Jesus at the beginning of Mark chapter nine understood and now had evidence of who Jesus was. They were clear that they were now walking with the son of God. As they were preparing to come down from this mountain, it was very clear that Jesus wasn't time for him to be revealed. And so he shares with the disciples, um, don't tell anyone just yet, just yet, hold this tight. Don't tell just yet who I am. So now they find themselves coming down the mountain of Mount Sinai. And when they get down to the mountain, they are encountered and they walk into an argument. Nobody wants to walk into an argument. Many times if we see one going, we try to go the other way because we really don't want to be engaged in anybody else's stuff. Jesus walks into an argument that the disciples are in that are there. The disciples and the teachers of the law are in an argument argument and Jesus is asking what are you all arguing about and in the midst of him asking what you all are arguing about there was a man who was there and he says Jesus I need you to help me just there was a man there who understood that there was some problems going on there was a man who needed his son to be healed in our text today that we have read we find out that in the midst of this argument this man is sharing with Jesus that his son has been and possessed of a spirit that has robbed him of his speech. Jesus is having a conversation where this man is explaining to him that whenever um, this happens to his son, this very thing that robs him takes control of his son and throws his son and puts foam in his mouth and gnashes his teeth. Jesus is in this place where this man is telling him about his son and Jesus' first response wasn't that he commanded the unclean spirit to come out. His first statement was not to the man but to the people who were gathered and to the disciples when he says you unbelieving generation how long shall I stay with you um, how long shall I put up with you bring the boy to me now the reality is as I am listening and watching and reading this text as I am studying one of the things that we realize is the disciples who are there with the teachers of the law and the man whose son who had an unpure spirit or an unclean spirit one of the things that we know these are the same disciples who had already found success in driving out demons these were the same disciples who had already had success healing the sick these were the same disciples who knew the power of Jesus but with the commentators what caught me as I was preparing was the commentators suggest that the reason that the disciples were ineffective in this point that they had a temporary loss of their spiritual authority. Come on, somebody. They they were temporary, temporarily separated in their relationship with Jesus Christ. And because they were temporarily separated, um, their, 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 their ability to function had been a compromise. Anybody ever realize that there, as much as we like to call on the name of Jesus, as much as we call ourselves as Christians, we find ourselves um, in places and times where it feels like we're ineffective. Here, the disciples found themselves in this situation. And Jesus' response was, was, was that you unbelieving generation. Not, not that they didn't believe in who Jesus was, but they, if, they no longer be believed in the authority and the power in which Jesus had given them. And here, when he sees this, he responds, what I thought was interesting, the father tells him about the son. Um, but Jesus doesn't ask the father to bring the boy to him. No, he asks the disciples, the ones who should have authority, the ones who should be able to do this, 
bring the boy to me. Jesus questions and asks them to bring the boy to them. And when they bring the boy to them, what is interesting about this is that the boy doesn't speak to Jesus. The spirit was the immediate one. The unclean spirit was the one who responds to Jesus. The one who supposedly doesn't know Jesus, but actually it was the unclean spirit that saw Jesus first. And when the spirit sees Jesus, it, it immediately now shakes and robs this boy. And Jesus is now witnessing what the father has shared with them. And so Jesus turns to the father's boy and he begins to ask the father, how long has he been battling with this thing? How long has he been robbed? How long has this thing taken over his life? And he says all of his life, uh, uh, it's the place in our lives when we've been battling something and no matter how much much we want to it can rob us of our very existence this boy had been living with this unclean spirit his entire life which meant that seemed like there was no hope for him but there is still more to come Jesus, Jesus is, is talking to the father and, and the father responds and tells him about the fact that this has happened his whole life and then the father does something that is interesting he says but if now you're talking to Jesus the Christ, the one who has come to be the redeemer of the, wo the world. You're talking to the one, God's only begotten son, but if you can. And Jesus, I can imagine him saying to himself, if I can, if you can, this is Jesus. He's saying to the man, if you can, Jesus is having this place. Like, do you know who I am? If you can. And the father says, when he says to Jesus this, the, the Jesus says, everything is possible possible to one who believes. Now this messed me up, y'all. This is a text that we hear all the time. When somebody is going through, we love to say, if you just believe, and it, everything is possible to him who believes. And here this man is like many of us. I'm, well, let me just say like Pastor Tammy. Um, you know, this is a man who's like me who says, I do believe, but Jesus helped me overcome my unbelief. Here is a man who understands who Jesus is. Here is a man who I truly believe knew and thought Jesus could do it. But here was a man who was wrestling with his reality and in his wrestling, it shows his dependency and his need for Jesus. In his wrestling, it shows that without Jesus, I'm not going to be able to do this, but with Jesus, I can. But catch this, as I was studying this and I kept reading this, and this is a text that we've heard so regularly, um, when it says everything is possible for one who believes, when the man says I do believe help my overcome my unbelief the thing that caught me is that in English you learn how to use periods commas exclamation points all of those things teachers y'all ready to get them right for the school year um the thing that separates the difference between I do believe and help me overcome my unbelief was a semicolon it wasn't a period these are two complete statements that uh, mean something they have a meaning and they're connected but there's a semicolon that separates these two sentences well I need help I, I think I paid attention in English, but I had to go back and look at the dictionary. Um, and what I realized about a semicolon is that a semicolon um, separates two sentences, but it suggests there is still more to come. So when this man says to Jesus, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief, what he's saying is, Jesus, I believe, and I believe there is still more to come. And so in his unbelief, in his ability to speak to Jesus, Jesus now talks back to the man. He gets the boy after he has uh, has identified the fact that he needs to overcome the very thing that's robbing him of his belief. Jesus takes the boy and he commands the spirit to come out. Ah, uh, what, what is so interesting about that? Jesus, in one word, tells the spirit to come out. Um, that's good news for someone who's struggling in their places of unbelief. Uh, it's good news for someone because Jesus is letting us know through the life of this person that the miracle isn't healing the man. The miracle is in the semicolon. The miracle is in the fact that you might be in a place in your life right now where it feels like you have unbelief, but there's still more to come. Jesus lets us know in this place that there is more to come with this young man's life. And it's interesting because after he commands the spirit to come out, the people, the spectators, those who are around in this moment, they look at this 
this body. They look at this young man. The unclean spirit has now come out. And they look at a man and they said he looks like it's a corpse. It says that the child's body looks like a corpse. It looks like the very thing that had robbed him was killing him. Oh, but because Jesus is the semicolon in his situation, Jesus has the power to command the spirit to come up and there is still more to come. But when I say there's still more to come, Jesus takes the young boy by his hand, stands him up, and the boy lives. That's good news for someone because the very thing that you feel like is about to take you out, the very thing that feels like it's about to kill you, Jesus is saying, I am your semicolon. Jesus, in this text with the disciples, When this man is talking to him about his son, Jesus shows up in the midst of an argument. Jesus shows up in the midst of what looks like the day is done. Jesus shows up when it looks like there is no hope and allows the disciples to see that with the power of Jesus Christ, you can overcome anything. As I was going through my week this week, again, I'm going to say, like I said, 9 o'clock, this is not a political statement. I'm not telling you who to vote for. I don't want nobody to say, Pastor Tammy said X, Y, and Z. I'm, I'm just caveating that. But I was watching the Democratic National Convention, Convention and I watched the Republican National Convention because we all need to be informed. It, it didn't dawn on me the night that Kamala Harris, Vice President Kamala Harris was speaking, I had no clue, it didn't dawn on me, it didn't register that it was 60 years to the date that Fannie Lou Hamer had spoke to the Democratic National Convention. And for those who have studied Fannie Lou Hamer, her entire fight was so that women of color and people of color would have the opportunity to vote. Mess me up because I'm watching this and I'm in tears. For those who follow me on Facebook, you saw it, so you already know the story. It messed me up because as I began to, to listen to this and see what was happening before me, the age I am now was the age my grandmother was then. And she couldn't vote. And Fannie Lou Hamer and many others who fought for the rights for people, had faith, but they also needed help overcoming their unbelief. 60 years later, we are alive to witness the very thing that she just wanted us to have the right to vote. There's the opportunity for a woman of color to actually run for the highest office in the nation. Why is that important? It's because it doesn't matter what it looks like now. It doesn't matter how much it looks like things are defeated. Jesus has the power to command and to speak things into existence. After the boy stands up after Jesus has now helped the father in his unbelief. The disciples, like many of us, when we can't figure out why we didn't know how to do something, we don't, we don't go in public and say we don't know how to do it. We won't talk in private. So the disciples go off in private with Jesus. And they say, Jesus, uh, um, why couldn't we do it? And Jesus' simple response was a relational response. His simple response was some things require prayer. Oh, that's good news because some things that are happening in your life right now, Jesus is saying it requires prayer. The very thing that you need to overcome in your life, it requires a communication and a conversation with Jesus Christ. Some things that are happening in our lives right now, it won't happen in the public. It'll happen in private, but it'll happen because you have decided to be in relationship with the one who can help you overcome anything. The good news is that no matter 
matter what's happening in your life right now, there is still more to come. When I think about the Olympians, when I think about Fannie Lou Hamer, um, and many of you can probably name some people in your lives, when you think about the very things that they had to overcome, they didn't stop in the midst when life robbed them. They kept going believing that they will be an overcomer. And that's good news. The miracle is the semicolon. The miracle is that there is still more to come. But we have a responsibility. It's a simple responsibility. It's just being in relationship. The Bible says that prayer, if you ask anything in his name, that helped my um, all I got to do is go and have communication with the one who has the power to command whatever's happening to stop. But in order to do that, prayer is a communication language. It's, it's a place between you, Jesus and the Father, um, our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. It is a relationship. And so I invite you today, as the praise team prepares to come, I invite you today to ask yourself a question. What are the areas in your life where you believe in who Jesus is, but you're still struggling with some unbelief. You're still struggling saying, Lord, how, how am I going to stop this thing from robbing me of the very joy that I know you have for me? How am I going to stop this thing from taking over my life and making me feel like that this thing is going to win? That thing, you name that thing. And that thing is different for everyone. Some, it's unbelief. That, that thing is different for everyone. Um, it could be your job. It could be a relationship. It could be a family member. It's that thing that it feels like there is no hope. It has seized you. It is taking over. And today, I invite you to speak to that thing. Because we serve a semicolon God who says there is still more to come. It isn't going to take you out. It isn't going to kill you. It isn't going to end you because Jesus, the Savior, is your advocate. And so I invite you, as the praise team lifts up this selection, before we pray, the, the powerful thing about this father, in order, in order for Jesus to take out the impure spirit, anybody who's in leadership and worked with me at Epworth knows that like, the father had to name what it was. Had to name it. I had to put it plainly what the issue was. And so the, I, I invite you as a praise team comes to sing. Name that thing that is robbing you of living into the fullest power as a disciple. Name that thing so that you can take it to Jesus in prayer and say, Jesus, help me with my unbelief. And I declare before God that I believe without a shadow of a doubt that the very thing that you name, you will see Jesus helping you to overcome it. Amen. Sometimes I fall to my knees and pray. Come, Jesus, come. Let today be the day. Sometimes I feel 
like I'm gonna pray, but I'm holding on to the hope that won't fail. Come, Jesus, come. We've been waiting so long for the day you return to heal every hurt and right every wrong. Jesus come.